Every refinery needs to go through a periodic maintenance procedure. When we are talking about our turnaround, which is 40 days and over 700,000 man hours, it's definitely a major event. How do you plan 20,000 activities? How do you plan the resources for 20,000 activities on a gun chart? The major problem is controlling it in real time. How do you control such an event in real time and manage the developing work, managing the unknown? This is the main challenge of the tournament. We were looking for a tool that can be implemented in the new digital world that will enable us to understand in real time the uh, actual picture. And I think that this was the game changer of this turnaround. Obviously the quality of decision is, is uh, on a totally different scale. Now, when I'm coming to the daily meeting, I already know the situation. I have seen it online. I saw it on my screens. And when I'm coming, the time is devoted to solving the problems not to understanding the picture, the picture is known. That's the major difference. Data collection is, is very important and is definitely helpful when planning uh, the next turnaround. This made a change in this turnaround and enabled us to, to be on time. And when it comes to turnaround, time is money. Good morning everybody, I'm Paul Muir from Mobileo and Malaki Alper here is one of our customers in Israel actually and uh, the, the Paz refinery there is I think the Europe's, Europe, Middle East and Africa's most profitable refinery. Malaki is making simply one point, that in the execution phase of a turnaround, knowing the status, knowing what's going on is a fundamental driver of the ability to manage the turnaround to an outcome somewhat similar to the plan. So what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, 35 minutes is, is, is about management and, and really focusing on schedule. I was, however, extremely impressed with the safety presentation, and in particular the, the passion there. And it's, it's worth pointing out that our company, founded 10 years ago in Israel, was founded around safety. Our, our company was founded around uh, Israeli F-16 fighter maintenance. Uh, it, was, it was found that every time an F-16 falls out of the sky, it can be traced back to maintenance that was done incorrectly by people who were not following procedures. So there's a big part of what we do today that's around extremely detailed, complex management of procedures in a field environment. Uh, and we'll touch on some of that later, but today's presentation is prim primarily focused around, around uh, time management. Uh, the other thing I'd like to you know, link back to is just the passion around, around the, the presentation we saw on safety. 
I think passion is, is great for everybody, no matter what you're doing. I get passionate about technology. Um, it's good to get passionate, I think, on the front end rather than reactively. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I'm 53 years old. I consider being a born-again millennial. Uh, I love family, I love communication, I'm passionate about uh, coaching, but with two kids that are millennials, somebody in the family needs to be focused on making money. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to just be an old guy a little longer, and hopefully when they get out of college, I'll be a born-again millennial. So, um, just before we move on, uh, that fire is in Israel, and today we've got Jerusalem in the news. I don't know if you've been tracking what's been happening the last couple of days. So, uh, this I'm really positioning as an educational um, uh, session, uh, but we're going to throw in free of charge at no extra cost some basic Hebrew lessons. I hope you'll all enjoy. So when you go back to the office tomorrow, you'll be able to tell your boss about the great value you got out of the presentation. We're going to talk about uh, managing turnarounds. We're going to talk about managing to Sababa. We'll get to that shortly. We're going to talk about digitalization. It's a bit of buzzwords. Um, generally, I'm a 100% buzzword compliant kind of guy. But for this, this audience, I'd like somebody to throw heavy objects at me if I, if I use any words that you don't understand. We're going to try and keep it layman's terms. Um, I was an engineer a long, long time ago, 30 years ago. I was a ship's engineer, so I've done my fair share of you know, operator rounds, daily inspections and overhauls. Uh, but for the purposes of this discussion, regard me as a geek and, and a nerd. Uh, we're then going to talk through a real uh, case study. So the first thing is a little bit of Hebrew then. So um, I sat in the pre-conference sessions on, on Monday and there was a lot of conversation about planning. And I'm a big fan of a plan. Uh, I've never planned a turnaround, but I've planned many annual business plans. Uh, and there's just as many moving plans, and moving targets in a, in a business plan as there is in a turnaround. One thing that this fixes is the schedule. This year will end on December 31st. We're not extending until January the 4th. But we've got to make money in that time frame. So there's different kinds of pressures. We talked on Monday about the perfect plan. And the first word I'd like to teach you is Mitsuyan. That's Hebrew for perfect. I don't think anybody in this room is, is, thinks they're creating the perfect plan. But we work hard over 18 months and two years to produce a very good plan. I think the important thing about plans is they're a roadmap. What a plan says is, if all of these had things happen this way, in this time, we will end up with this result. That's true. It's demonstrable. I think they're a roadmap which proves that we can deliver this. They're a way to get people rallied around the common objective. And if we share that plan with contractors, we can get them bought in and reduce the risk of execution that way. But Mitsoyan, Mitsoyan, does anybody speak Hebrew in here? That's going to correct me on my pronunciation. Mr. Yang, perfect, is probably not what we're shooting for in a real turnaround scenario. Now, what we definitely do not want is the other end of the spectrum. We do not want Balagan. Balagan is Hebrew for one big mess, right? So we're trying to avoid Balagan. But what is the difference between Mr. Yang and Balagan? It's really management. And if we do a good job of managing and a good job of dealing with the curveballs and leverage in our experience, we can manage to come out somewhere around Sababa. Sababa is, that was good, cool, awesome, right? We did a good job managing to that outcome. So from my perspective, management is, 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 is something I'm passionate about. And as a manager, what do I crave? There must be a lot of people out here that are managers. What's, what's the single biggest thing a manager needs? Information, right? If you don't know what's going on, if you're completely in the dark, if you're blindfolded in death, you're not going to make any kind of decision, let alone a good one. So the craving for management and information is what we're going to spend a lot of time talking about today. And, and Malachi in the video, I've never met him face to face, but we have spoken on the phone. He, he tells me that the decisions are never difficult. When he's got the information about what the current situation is, what his options are, what his priorities are, the decisions are typically not tricky. But getting that information is the tricky piece. Um, just one final reference back to the world that you live in. Um, the, the Monday sessions were invaluable, and if any of you come to the conference next year, I would urge you to try and get here early and sit through these sessions. Colin, who spoke earlier, was, was the morning presenter. Uh, there was a number of things which, we, which were, were agreed as being major contributors to schedule slippage. Uh, handover uh, of, of, of information or handover responsibility between different stakeholders on the, on the, on the activity, uh, how you manage breaks, 
uh, Colin talked a lot about two versus three shift, uh, shift patterns, etc. Permitting came up as a major roadblock all the time. People walking around, you know, just the strategy around where you site, tents, etc. Meetings and reporting effectiveness, uh, big one. Spending a lot of time in meetings, getting on the same page as your, your colleagues and understanding where to move forward. And who's in these meetings uh, was a big topic in the afternoon on Monday. Pure supervision, when the cat's away, the mice will play, uh, is, is another topic. And that's related to meetings and reporting. If the boss is in meetings all the time, if the boss is writing reports all the time, he's not supervising uh, craftspeople. Uh, waiting on tools and, and other things. Waiting on information. You're out there, you don't have the torque value, you do not have the piping isometric, you don't have the work instruction. That's another major delay. And finally on this list, discovery management. How do you respond to discoveries in the field? How do you categorise them between minor and major? And what's the process to get these things resolved? So. Um, this, I think, is all industry agreed things. The, the stuff in bold here is stuff which I am certain that improved communication, uh, real-time communication and capture of data can dramatically impact the uh, performance. So, on, uh, so we've moved past Hebrew and we're now on to the second educational part of the programme. Um, digitisation, digitalisation. Hands up uh, who is hearing that, those sorts of words in the workplace, not at conferences like this. Okay, about 40% of you. Hands up who know, thinks they know what that is uh, and know where to start in their organisation. Okay, 7.5% of you. Um, so I'm a tech guy, um, and I, so I've been doing this for about 25 years, and I think it's, I'd, I'd say that in the last two or three years there's been more tech stuff come to market in, 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 in the last in the 20 years before that. Uh, if any of you were here for the Jacobs presentation at four o'clock last night, you will have seen uh, the gentleman that fell off the mountain bike bombard us with technology. We've got RFID tags, we've got on-site Wi-Fi, we've got drones, we've got artificial intelligence, augmented reality. There's a few buzzwords flying around there, I know. Uh, there's just a lot of stuff. So this, this movement to digitize and digitalize isn't necessary, you know, I think it's just driven by a realisation that there's a ton of stuff available today and the, the trigger is really the cloud. Now the cloud is not just the new name for the internet, right? We've still got an internet. The cloud is, is clever stuff on the internet that actually does things. It's websites that do things, provide service, store information, and process information. So the cloud joins all these things up. And it's at a far lower price point than ever before. And here's the best bit, you don't need to tell the IT guys. Right? You can get a lot of stuff done now. You take, you know, I'm not advocating under the radar sneaking IT in, right? We still got to do the security thing, etc. But you, you don't need IT guys to deliver this. We can, we can join these things up. You can access these things in the cloud very dynamically, very, very quickly. So I think the digitization agenda is really driven by the availability of a basket of technologies which have never been easier to pull them together. Now the next part of the educational program is, is the bit you really want to remember because this is a bit that's going to really impress people and make you more attractive to women if you really internalize this. Okay. Digitization, digitalization and digital business transformation. Are these all just the same thing? Now, I'm Scottish, Colin, so I'm not English, but I feel your pain. Um, Digitalisation is not just how the Queen says digitisation by throwing in an extra syllable, right? I'm going to give you my layman's uh, definition of these things. Digitisation is really old school. We've been digitising since I was in short pants. I can remember my first year in the IT industry and Adobe came along with this thing called PDF and I thought, what's the point of that? I really didn't understand it or get it. But that was, that was, that was you know, the start of the digital content. I was selling CAD systems when this, the CAD vendors started to scan drawings. That's digitization. It's taking analog information or paper-based stuff and making it digital. And that's cool, right? The benefits of digitization are quality, consistency, access to information. There's a lot of benefits in digitization. Getting paper out of the field is a good thing, I believe. But it's not new. Now, digitalization, 
So an extra syllable in there, but what digitalization is about process. When you stop thinking just about taking paper out of the field and replacing it with electronic forms, you're now digitalizing. You're saying, what is our process? How do we communicate? How do we get things done around here? And let's electrify or digitalize that, that whole process. The third thing is digital transformation. And for me, that's all about innovation. Once we've got our head around digital stuff in the field and we're starting to think about how our organization works, let's innovate. Now, I'm going to give a case study here and it's got elements of all of this in it. But innovation around process, doing things smarter, doing things differently, and also introducing new services. So particularly if you're, if you're an EPC or a service provider or a service company, taking the opportunity to think, what new things can I do for my customer? What new business models can I introduce for my customer, new pricing models for my customer, because I'm, I'm using smarter tools and smarter process? So this is the end of the IT piece of the presentation. I'm passionate about IT. I, I think there's a lot of opportunity. And if you look at productivity gains in your industry over the last 20 years, I'll think that you, you'll see you're maxing out and you're only going to get that next level through technology. So I hope you can all go back to the ranch and... Uh, and, and, and get excited about what technology can do for your part of the business. So, uh, real, real life now. I've been at several conferences this year. This is the first one I've spoken to. I've, I've, I've heard several other people talk about digitization and why oil and gas isn't even in the top 10 of industries around this, this area and why it's absolutely imperative you digitize or digitalize. What I didn't hear at any of those conferences is what is it really and where do I start? And, and where's the business case? Because there's still pragmatists out there. Now, I'm telling you what I believe, which is this ship is leaving the, the harbour and you need to be on it. How you get on it, exactly when you get on it, is, is down to you. But there's a lot of pragmatic people out there who are going to say, oh, I get it, it's cool, it's technology, I get it, iPads, they're cute, right? But what's the bottom dollar saving? Am I going to save heads? Am I going to save money? So I'm going to give you some data which hopefully will convince you that um, you can save some money uh, and also dramatically de-risk your project. I'm so confident in the savings that all $3.2 million of the money that I won last night is, is going to underwrite this confidence and you can, you can call me on it. So, uh, recent turnaround, half a million man-hours. Uh, it was a $25 million capital tie-in to a $300 million project. Um, we, um, we managed, welding was deemed to be on the critical path, so we implemented the system to manage welding. Um, there was initially about 750 planned welds, that was about 30,000 inches of welding um, and uh, we had about 80 users using the system. So the people that were using the system were um, foreman, general foreman, QA leads, uh, QCs uh, and obviously turnaround coordinators. It was a 30 day project and it came in on time. Um, so the objective, we sat down with this particular customer and said, what are we trying to achieve here? Uh, and these were the, the high level objectives. We're trying to figure out that, or prove that having real time visibility into what go, is going on out there improves manageability. Uh, and particularly we wanted to look at the handover between uh, teams and trades, right? So when does the welder finish welding hand over to the the QC to get the NDE done, etc., etc. You'll see the process in a, separate, in a second. Um, we wanted to dramatically improve our responsiveness to delays, we know they're going to happen, and we wanted to figure out how we can use less people in the field. Um, so again, we were tracking the process from pre-weld, you know, uh, fit up of, of welds. My dad, my dad was a welder. The best joke I know is about welders. I can't tell it on this stage, but come and see me later. Um, um, right through all the, the welding, right through completion and commissioning. One of the aspects of the project was, in this case, we did not integrate to P6. 99% of our projects were integrated with P6. This project was done, it was a bit of a fire drill. We got the opportunity about three weeks before they, they started shutting down the plant. Um, the, the P6 structure they had was not conducive to doing anything particularly clever with our environment. I'll come back to that. So in this one, we were not integrated directly to P6. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about that later. So I don't expect you to read that, but that's the process. That was the welding process, welding all the way through to commissioning, and you see the different roles there and how we managed all the different uh, NDE activities. <coughs> so, 
what, what is it really? What did it really do? So where we start off, and this is, this is a weld log, so we've got a great big list of welds that need to get done. This could be anything, this could be uh, a whole lot of work packs, uh, it could be uh, inspection activities, it could be you know, fixed equipment overhaul, anything. We just have a list. Now that list, in this case, is a spreadsheet, but if you've got that list of activities coming out of P6, we'll take that too. Um, that list needs to be organised in a way where if we're going to be pulling up certain people in the field, given certain people or teams work to do, this list needs to know about who those people are, what their responsibilities are, what activities and fields. So there's a little bit of manipulation goes on here, but you're going to have 90% of this information already as part of your, of your plan. We upload that to our cloud, which for those that care is, is on Amazon, which is a, a secure, uh, proven platform uh, around the world. And what you end up with, uh, once you do that upload, is a great big dashboard with all your activities on it. And those activities can be organised by area, unit, zone, by trades. Uh, they can have any level of granularity. So what I mean by that is, if you're happy to say, has this activity started? Is it work in progress or is it complete? That's good. That may be a big a major step forward from what you have today. Equally, in the case of the Israeli Air Force, they take every activity and break it down to turn the screwdriver, press the button, disconnect the electricity. And there's a sign-off at every stage. If you go into the aviation industry, there's inspectors that pretty much stand right beside technicians and they crank on things, they sign it off, and they crank on things and sign it off. So there'll be some things you do where you might see value in really baby-stepping people through procedures so we can get down to that detail. If we're down at that detail, we can manage at that detail even if you never planned in that detail. So if you're a planner, and I'm talking about turning bolts, you're thinking there's no way we're going to plan at that level. It's not the plan that breaks down at that level, it's the procedure. So you've got a digital procedure which explodes the activity down into those sub -steps. Anyway, we end up with this dashboard, and this is the area where your coordinators are pushing tasks out to individuals or contractors or teams and getting stuff done. And the colours change on the dashboard, so things that are, are, are finished are dark green, things which are grey are, uh, are not started, light green means work in progress. And you'll also see that, um, you know, we've got these uh, status things, uh, in this case, in this one we haven't got a percentage complete um, for various reasons, but the percentage complete is calculated as nobody's opinion. So if we've got procedures or we've got a set of norms that say for these activities when we take heat exchanger tubes out, or 25% done, that is calculated and presented as a calculation. It's nobody's opinion, nobody's guess, nobody's barefaced lie, it's real data. So this is the environment in which your coordinators will push out work, uh, reprioritize work, uh, and, and drive the progress of the system. Now, the guys in the field, they're walking around with iPads, or the, or the foremen are walking around with iPads, or Android, Android devices or Windows tablets and what they're looking at is something like this. So first of all they've got a big fat finger interface and on the left, oops, go back, on the left hand side here that's their inbox, that's the things they've got to get done today. Um, you can prioritise them to make sure they focus on the important stuff and not the fun stuff and if there's a lot of things need to get done they can filter based on, on, on you know, trades or different activities. If, you, if they click on any, any particular activity, then on the right hand side, what's presented to them is data about that activity, the work order number. Uh, it could also be links to piping isometrics, it could be links to historic maintenance information, etc. So we, we're pushing out to people in the field all the information they need to get their job done. You know, so this walking around waiting for information should be less of a problem. Now this, this is not a welding form, I just pulled this one up because it's got a couple of things to show you. So here's a fundamental point. If you're thinking about digitisation and you're thinking about replacing paper in the field, you may have a tendency to think about information capture. I'm going to be filling in digital forms now, not filling in paper forms. But the form in this world is, is really much more than that. It, it, it's an ability to push instructions to the field contextualise the activities, push information to the field, baby step them through procedures and capture information in line with that activity. 
So in this particular form, we we're, we're, excuse me, this particular form, we're saying, you know, remove turning gear, etc. Tick. Yes, I did it. Uh, there's a little drawing there. If you click on the drawing, the drawing goes full screen and you can see the reference information. Um, do another thing. Now with this one here, we're saying take a measurement and enter the value. Right, and th this is intelligent. So if you enter a stupid value, it's going to go, hold on. This is meant to be between 2.4 and 4.2 and you just enter 240. So let's go back and check that. You can capture photographs. You can capture your current GPS location. Anyway, the point is, this is an intelligent application. It's pushing information, it's pulling information, and it's got logic. Ask this question. If the answer is yes, jump to page three, etc. So it's really an intelligent application. It's no longer just a PDF form replacing paper. So you can drive quality, you can drive consistency, you can drive compliance. I haven't got a screenshot of the signature page, but when the guys finish doing this, they sign it off with their finger. So there's an accountability aspect to this. This one is, is one that relates back to one of the key problems. This is an example of a, of a deficiency or discovery management process. So you're halfway through doing the core process, you've got a problem, you can pull up a form, you can, you can categorise the, uh, the type of discovery, the kind of recommendation, you can take photographs. Now again, this is intelligent. So one of the conversations on Monday was, what kinds of discoveries do you need to take to a meeting versus what kind of discoveries can you authorise a contract or just go fix right there and then? So in this world, you can say, okay, if, if the contractor categorises the damage type as type X, you can take a photograph to prove it was damaged, you can fix it, you can take a photograph to prove you fixed it and we'll pay. It. Types A, B and C of damage, take photographs, let's have a meeting. Right. So you, you know, so I heard conversations on Monday. People saying seven days to get engineering to respond to a discovery. Now, in that particular case, the individual had a dog in the fight, and uh, and was trying to prove he was right. You know, but you know, days responding to discoveries is material impact on your ability to keep moving, your ability to do the smart thing, your ability to do the fast thing. Um, this is important as well. So back to this form, right? We're clicking on stuff, we're reading stuff, we're entering data. We've now got a lot of data in the system. So when we think about the old world with reports, um, you might still want reports that look like that, and that's okay. Because once the data's in the system, I can push a button, spit it out looking like anything you like. You can have your logo over here, you can have photographs on the bottom, I don't care, right? The key thing is that you got compliance and the reporting is not a separate activity. Nobody is going back to any trailer or tent to sit in and do any paperwork. You do the activity, you sign it with your big fat finger and the boss can run as many reports at his leisure anytime he likes. Right? So, you know, if you still think about paper formats, we can still deliver that. But the form is really just an access to a database at this point. And uh, closeout activities, yeah. So there was a speaker yesterday was talking about the impact of closeout activities. Uh, I think it was Paul from Redwater, you know. Uh, so this closeout type stuff is dramatically, it's really automated. So real, real life action shot, guy in, guy in the field, hard hat and iPad, uh, coordinators watching all of that stuff on a dashboard, watching the colours changing. Obviously green I don't worry about, red stuff I need to worry about. I can go in, click, I can drill down. Right, so when you, something goes red, you can click on it and it'll come up and say, Joe Soap, this contractor's meant to be doing this. Should have started at lunchtime Friday. It hasn't started yet. You can really drill down and figure out what's going on, decide what you want to do about it. Different people need different bit types of information. And this is my particular favourite. It's a heat map. And I'm sure lots of you have seen this. But in this, in this particular case, this is a, back to our first customer. It's a welding application. And the heat map is a bunch of squares. The size of the square roughly relates to the size of the problem or the size of the risk. And the color of the square represents the status, right? So if we had big work packages or work packages on things that because of performance data, we expect to find problems when we go and have a look inside, we can rank that as higher risk. So now if I'm a turnaround coordinator or a turnaround manager and I walk in and I have a look at that, 
I can immediately ask, why is this big scary thing here with lots of gremlins and dragons not even being looked at yet and we're on day nine of the turnaround? And why are we messing around, you know, swapping out filter pods instead of doing that, right? So, you know, I'm a high level guy, I don't know necessarily know the detail, but I'm walking in and going, hmm, talk to me about this, guys. Right? So I love the heat map for that reason. Um, uh, this one wasn't integrated to P6, so we don't have the, the critical path, but normally if it's integrated to P6, these squares will, anything on the critical path will have a red outline around it. So you can see the scary stuff, the not so scary stuff, and the, and the critical path stuff. And you can then ask intelligent questions about what's going on. Now, they are back to the man with the iPad. When you're clicking on this stuff, if we've got cellular data, if we've got Wi-Fi, because we haven't figured out the carrier pigeon thing yet, right? All of that is in real time, right? I mean, you know, you click, say, I've done this, I've finished this well, it, the dashboard is uploading in real time, right? So your um, plans are great, updating the schedule, absolutely essential. But if you want to work in increments of an hour or four hours or a shift, you're not getting that from P6. Anybody beg to differ? Right. So the real-time management of the project is really driven by this. So what we find is our customers, for real-time information, for heat-of-the-battle type things, they're looking at our screens. They do absolutely religiously update the schedule. Updating the schedule is now automatic. Your schedulers are not, no longer typists. The schedulers are now thinkers. Right? So we're, the time that they spend is not clacking in data, it's looking at the bigger problem, finding out what our priorities are, amend the schedule, and then we, re we reload the schedule, right? So we're, we're the, the schedule is a rolling thing. Other people are getting excited about other things. So there's, there's how we're doing on wells per day, you know, per diameter, inches to go, that kind of thing. And again, you can click on these things and, and drill down. Um, uh, you may want to know what the problems are out there. What types of problems are we seeing? Do they relate to contractors? In this particular project, there are two welding contractors. One was having a much higher rejection rate. When they drilled into the data, they got down to Joe Soap. Joe Soap was having a three times the percentage of weld you know, QC failures than anybody else. So they were able to go quickly to that contractor and say, this guy's got to get, you know, get off the project. Um, so again, you can drill down and drill down and look at your things. Uh, and you, know, you might have a boss somewhere that if you just give them two or three numbers, you can keep them out of your face, keep them out of the tent, keep them happy, keep them out of meetings, keep them stop asking you for reports and let you get on and drive the project to completion. So we can slice and dice days all, all day long. Um, so that's just a few examples. So what were the lessons learned? Um, on, on this particular project, you know, P6 integration, shame we didn't get it done, it would have made a big difference. In particular, that would have allowed us you see the dashboards I showed you, there were shades of green. With P6 integration, you'll see some orange and red in there. Orange is at risk of being late, red is you're already late. Without the schedule integration, we were just various stages of progress not related back to the schedule. Um, if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you've got a schedule integration, you can do much more intelligent allocation of activities. So rather than saying to people, here's you know, three shift look ahead of activities, go pick one, you can actually, you know, very, you know, you, know, you can target activities very accurately out to people, making sure people are not doing fun stuff, they're doing critical stuff, etc. So the schedule integration was a, was a big deal. Um, they also wanted um, a, a maximum one hour refresh on the dashboard. So the live activity view is live. It's, 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 it's happening, it's changing. The other big dashboards, you know, they can be anything from, yeah, depending on how much money you pay, 10 seconds out a day to, to 10 hours. They felt one hour was the maximum. To be useful to them, they need to know what had happened in the last hour. And there was various stakeholder reports that we evolved over time to give people what they wanted. Now, in terms of getting started, what was interesting about this project was that they had a kind of hybrid model. So they had all of this data coming out of our system, but when they did their shift handover meetings, they felt it was really valuable for people to look at the data on their iPad but still walk up to a big whiteboard and write their numbers on the board and have that kind of social aspect of the handover uh, and have the ownership of the numbers associated with getting the numbers and writing them on the wall. They felt that that was a lot of value. Um, normally our customers will have 84 inch monitors hanging on the wall, uh, but in this case they went for the hybrid approach. I think they're going to go fully digital next time. 
contractor buy-in critical, right? You're paying contractors to get work done. In many cases, the contractor systems, own systems work really well. They certainly work really well for the contractor. Uh, if there's any glitches with the technology, if there's any breakdown in process, if people lose their iPads, contractors will be quick to revert to how they want to work. So you need to be on it, making sure you get the buy-in, making sure the training's there, and making sure you support them. So those were the key lessons learned on the project as it related to technology. So some numbers then. Um, here we go. So we, I sat, I went down on a, a, a bit of debrief meeting. So we went through some hard data. Um, and they, their experience, um, they saved about two hours a day for each foreman just on chasing numbers. Right? They, they felt that historically or normally the foreman were running around getting data to present to keep people higher up more comfortable about what was going on. So saving two hours a day per foreman, they reckon was about $90,000 saving and that was 100% down to the, the mobility platform. Um, when, when foreman and cats away, might as well play, there was a 10% productivity gain there. Uh, on previous projects, they, they had a full-time guy just counting weld inches to go, and that job was eliminated. And the, fi the final one's actually more interesting, we'll come back to that, but um, they reckon they saved 18 inspectors on this job, which is over half a million bucks, which is not entirely uh, attributed to the technology, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But over a 30-day turnaround, they made 300% of their money. If you're good with math, you can figure out what they paid for the system. Right? So I don't. I mean, I know a lot of accountants. People get excited about 300% return in 30 days. Yeah. The bigger deal was they met the schedule. They, this was a turnaround on a unit um, which they'd done a very similar thing a year earlier, same unit, seven days late. This one came in on schedule. It was two million dollars production a day, so it was a six million dollar uh, production uh, save, uh, and they attributed it to. Um, Adding real-time visibility on top of what um, uh, P6 was giving them, it, it gave them on average a two-day visibility advantage. Um, that means you can make better decisions earlier. Right? You got the facts, you got them earlier. I mean, there was a meeting on Monday, and there was somebody was telling a story about, well, you know, if I'd known that three days ago, I would have made a better decision. So, better decisions earlier, big part of it. Uh, status is calculated, not estimated. Uh, they completely eliminated the NDE wait times, almost. I spoke to two of the field coordinators, they said in the previous turnaround, their walkie-talkie cell phone was just, where's my NDE guy, where's my NDE guy? You're busy chasing the welding company, and the welding company's going, we're done, the NDE guy's not sure. These cord this one coordinator said he had two phone calls in, in a month, chasing the NDE, two. He said the last one, that's all he did was make apologies for NDE guys and chasing. Um, now this, this next point is, is, is good because it's innovation. One of the things they did on this turnaround that enabled that 18 uh, headcount reduction on inspectors was they decided to divide the work up into six, six or seven zones in place. So rather than having 100 inspectors in one tent, they put 13 inspectors in, in you know, six, seven tents. That moves the people nearer the work, um, it, it reduces travel time, uh, eases coordination. Great idea. The downside of that is, if I don't have visibility into what they're doing, it's possible to have one really busy team and one team with a bunch of feet up on the desks and I don't know. But with this technology, they were able to have their teams in the zones, but also see the, the workload of each team. So they were able to then flex the zones and say, I know you're zone two, but since it looks like you've got not, not much else to do, get across the zone six because they're struggling. So having that zone, zoning thing was their idea, that was innovation, but the technology supported that in real life and gave them the flexibility uh, to add on to that innovation. So that, that would be, for me, I'll call that digital transformation, just so I can put one up on the board. Um, shift handover meetings, you saw Malaki talk about it at the start. Um, it's not about figuring out what just happened. What happened and where we're at already on the board what we're going to talk about is the fewest people in the room and need to talk about what the plan is for the next shift or two. Right? So there's no getting on the same page. We're all on the same page. There is a single source of truth. Um, contractors, I don't have a dog in this fight, but they, they, they feel that typically a contractor, when he's behind schedule, he'd like to talk about where he's going to be by midnight. Nobody wants to talk about why they're behind schedule now. They're going to project that, oh, by 2 a.m. we'll be caught up. 
Um, and if contractors get ahead of schedule, they don't want to necessarily tell you that because there's no extra points for that. They'll just sandbag that so they don't get a beating tomorrow. So eliminating that and just getting to the truth, can we just know where we're at? There's a major, a major uh, benefit in just keeping the ball rolling and making the right decisions. And then the last point was senior management just weren't hovering over them, asking them to do reports. We give the management your dashboard, there's your heat map, there's your KPIs. Anything you don't understand, let me know. So nobody was running around doing, doing reports. I'm quite sure a lot of you have had that where you, you can't get work done for writing reports for the boss. So that was the big thing they did in, as I say, $6 million of production. They, they came in on time versus seven, but they weren't going to attribute, that, attribute all of that to the system, but it was a major impact. So the future, what, what are they going to do in the future? P6 integration, we talked about, that's going to be, give many advantages. Uh, automated reporting, they actually didn't implement that. So the, the automatic production of all the, the closeout reports will be implemented in the next turnaround. They're also going to introduce ad hoc stuff. So there's a lot of stuff like scaffolding, painting, insulation that you don't necessarily plan in any detail. So that will all be managed in the system. They're going to put all critical path equipment in, in, in the system, excluding rotating equipment. Um, in their case, they've got a lot of you know, you know, complex proprietary equipment and the investment in digitizing all of those procedures to, to, to overhaul something which only gets done once every five years didn't make sense for them. So they're just going to stick with uh, fixed equipment instrumentation. Um, shop surveillance. So if you send a critical control valve off-site 45 miles away or more, how do you get comfort that that's progressing if that's on a critical path? Do you believe them? Do you send an inspector to site to stay there? Do you set up a webcam? With our system, you give the site a login to the system and he, he, he clicks on where he's at in the process and he takes photographs to prove it. So they're going to drive the critical off-site stuff through, through, through the system. Um, they're going to go for the digital 84-inch monitors, more management dashboards, and they're going to start spending a lot more time on analytics. Right? They're now collecting more data they're going to be able to use that data to go back to contractors and renegotiate contracts based on actual performance, uh, roll the actual detailed timing of activities, roll it back into their planning process so they can optimise that. Uh, and of course that you know feeds into all sorts of resourcing. The final slide before I open up to questions is, uh, is this one. This is again a different customer, but um, this slide is uh, not intuitive, so let me just talk you through a couple of things on it. This was a, a 30 day turnaround. Um, the, um, the green line is the original plan, so we had a, quite an aggressive ramp up of activity, flatlined at about 600 things a day, and then we have a big blip at the end. The big blip at the end is all documentation activities, closeouts. Um, we got involved and, and we looked at it, and then it's a bit aggressive on the front end. So we ramped up much more slowly, um, onboarded or mobilised contractors later, demobilised them earlier, uh, and we completely eliminated the documentation activity. So the actual burn rate, which is orange, there's no documentation, no closeout activity, then it's done. Um, the other thing you'll see is that by day, by day 10, We've got no, we've got no growth, right? So by taking out the lag time between needing uh, inspection and NDE and getting it, they were able to compress all the inspection on the front end, get the bad news earlier, and, and there was no surprises beyond day ten of this turnaround. Um, so um, again, that's some real life data. I think I send to the presentation. Any any questions? 